The following presentation was recorded at the 2017 ANZIC's Safety and Quality Conference. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, everyone, for having me. Um, I don't think I'm an expert. I think I'm just someone who's trying to sort out the mess of clinical life and trying to make it easier for patients. Um, but I have trained as a clinical educator in an interprofessional uh, uh, program. And I suppose what I want to say is preparing content is easy now. Uh, as you can tell, uh, there was some content from yesterday that, uh, at this conference that uh, I wasn't at, and I got to see it. I love this picture, but it's... Uh, uh, we are now in a mode where we don't we have a lot of content out there But now what we don't have is content in people's brains to do the work that we need to do and to change the system to way it the way that it supports uh, families and patients Just a little bit of back of my background um, These are my biases. I won't go into them too much, but effectively I like Vygotsky's socio-cultural learning theory learning by doing together and I'm really um, biased towards the coalface how do we actually work together? How do, how do uh, patient safety features and quality improvement work together at the interface to actually make daily life better for everyone? Um, I think where we're going at now uh, around MET is we've gone beyond knowledge and content generation around MET. What is it? What's it for? Why are we doing it? We've gone, I think, also beyond uh, the knowledge dissemination, so social media platforms internet. We can get information from anywhere. Now our government organisations, National Health and Medical Research Council, are thinking about how we actually translate research into practice. And where I'm really interested in is how do we actually do that at the coalface? So workplace-based socio-cultural learning. And how do we do it in a way where there is clinical performance or the human factors? How do we actually make it a patient and staff-centred experience inside the workforce? For those of you who haven't seen this paper, and I'm um, Geoffrey Braithwaite's talking next door at the moment, uh, he has been part of this movement which is called Resilient Healthcare. And it's a way of changing the model and paradigm about how we think about error and error recovery and how to make a resilient system. In other words, if parts of the function of a system fall off, how do we maintain the outcomes and the system continues to produce the same output? This changed my thinking about how I'm teaching and how I'm approaching simulation. So our current model, which is, includes also the root cause analysis, is based in the red square, which is the fo focus of safety is about the badness, the accidents and disasters that happened, and the time spent picking through the remains of what actually occurred. Whereas that's only about two to, two, two to five percent of what we actually do every day, if you think about it. And inside the green box is what we call safety two culture, which is most days, a lot of bad stuff almost happens, but doesn't. And in fact, a lot of good stuff happens. So why aren't we focusing on more of the good stuff? And how do we actually use the variations in practice as ways of learning about how to do things better? So this is the safety two paradigm. Everyday work has a performance variability. And most of the time, it is, operates in a mode where there is a successful outcome. There are no adverse events and people are happy. There is an acceptable outcome. And then there's failure. And where safety two differs from safety one is the fact that safety two focuses on the fact that the system generates the variability. The humans adapt to the system variation and try and prevent unacceptable outcomes. So failure is not about a person who did a bad thing or turned up to work drunk or did anything like that, it's more based around the fact that the system is wrong and the humans are trying to prevent the problems. <clears throat> and I think it also then speaks to the next bit, which in my mind, for anyone who's written a, a clinical protocol and then seen how it actually works, is the concept of work as imagined versus work as done. So who's, who's uh, seen a, a clinical incident and then tried to match it back to what the clinical policy was at the time? Was there a gap? <laughs> Sometimes there are some ridiculous things that happen uh, in the workplace uh, that you can't actually explain by policy or, or other things. And, and in the end, you find out that it's actually often system error and culture and how that occurs uh, is what I'm really interested in doing. So I've gone looking for other, other ways of thinking about uh, how the world works. And I've recently heard a man by the name of Tong Yi, who's a social enterprise expert from Singapore, who's created what's called the Thought Collective, which is a long-term project based around how to, how to provide services where the Singaporean government uh, fails to recognise or to um, 
and deliver services that might be culturally inappropriate for the government. Um, and what he says is the most important socio-cultural process is how to actually transform a narr narrative into something sustainable. That a lot of our problems these days are not technical, but uh, they're actually social adaptive issues to new ways of thinking and doing things and we have to nurture them and actually go and support them. And the way we need to work is we need to develop some responsibility in ourselves for developing social intervention. So in my mind, I think you want to focus on the right-hand side of this, which is the social enterprise approach, that there is a social problem, in, in this case a med call, a deteriorating patient. We have a program, which I don't think we have at uh, a national or an ANZ uh, level at the moment. We have an event, this conference, that happens every year, and we have a media platform. But I think where we're really missing in an educational and a workplace process is what is our program and how are we having a, con a conversation around the identity and content and what's the platform by which we deliver uh, the program. I think where we need to go is we need to create a, uh, use the current ecosystem and modify it. We need to work smarter. We need to reorganise the resources that we have. We need to share openly and commonly as much as we can. So the concept of creative commons becomes a, a major issue in, in terms of sharing content. I've also gone and found uh, work from the mental health, uh, community mental health services around implementation. And when we implement something, as what Anzix and Sikkim are doing now, is we need to set a standard. We need to measure what's important. And I think we only measure what we want to change. And we need to relate it to metrics that are important, like the patient reported outcome measures, which are starting to come through the system. And we also need to think about it as an implementation outcome. Did we actually do what we said we were going to do? Is it important to the service, which is what you can see in the middle box here? And at the end is, did the patients and the families really like what we did? And did it make a difference to them? And I think in terms of efficiency, we have to have um, use pre-existing metrics and registries, which we currently collect data for, but I could say that we probably don't report or use in quality improvement as much as we'd like. I think we do need to work out how we use the cognitive sciences more and we need to focus on deliberative practice and how we reflect and integrate our learning into everyday work. We need to reduce the silos, develop near-peer practice and develop uh, work-integrated learning. Here's a paper that uh, comes out of my place in Bendigo where it's actually asking junior doctors what's important in managing a patient deterioration. What do they do after they press the MET button and, when the met and between the MET team coming, what do they actually think about and what they do? And what do they actually need? So this information is now going back into the medical training system. And I think some of the things that we are teaching our medical students don't actually um, uh, translate into the clinical workplace when they become doctors. So this fits in with what we've been talking about before is we need to create a deliberative practice. We need to create a space and we need to create value in the workplace training systems that focuses on our, how we work as everyday people and how we focus on the training culture. Uh, there are wonderful examples of this in everyday life right now, so learning to mastery programs in Chicago <coughs> uh, that Bill McCacky has organised. And I uh, encourage those of you who are medical to read the bottom paper Mastery Learning, it's time for medical education to join the 21st century. Thank you.